Hello, I'm Ankeny White from um, Colby College. I teach um, East Asian art history there. And um, I'm one of the co-curators of the exhibition. So our first panel will get started right, right now. Um, it's titled Intermediality, Artistic I Experiments with Materials. And it was so nice that Eric Lefebvre ended with an image of ink and oil, because this is one of the very interesting things in this um, globalized context is the mixing and, and uh, experimenting um, across um, cultures in different kind of media. And particularly, um, this panel will look at um, a number of different ways in which Chinese ink and the calligraphic gesture um, have been incorporated in, in artistic work of the post-war period. Our first speaker is Iftikhar Dadi. He's an associate professor at Cornell University in the Department of History of Art. His research examines art as a global and networked practice from the late 19th century to the present. present. Another research interest is the media and popular cultures of South Asia. He's published a number of books, including Modernism and the Art of Muslim South Asia in 2010, an edited monograph, Anwar Jahal Shamsa, 19, uh, 2015, um, numerous other um, articles and uh, journal essays. Um, he serves uh, as on the editorial and advisory board of Asia Society's Archives of Asian Art Journal, uh, Bioscope, South Asian Screen Studies Journal, and the Art Journal. Uh, he's, he also has uh, done work as a curator. He's co-curated ex exhibitions including um, Lines of Control at the Johnson Museum of Art at Cornell. It also traveled to um, Duke and Taryama Translation uh, Queen's Museum of Art uh, in 2009 and also at the Johnson Museum um, in 2010. And he is also an artist, uh, and his work um, is done in collaboration with Elizabeth Dadi, um, and they show internationally, um, including right now, um, work in an exhibition in Oslo. Yes, in Norway. Our second speaker will be uh, Kui Yi Shun. Uh, Dr. Shun is professor of art history at the University of California, San Diego. His research focuses on modern and contemporary Chinese art. His publications include Light Before Dawn, uh, 2013, Arts of Modern China, 2012, which was a winner of the ICAS Book Prize in Humanities. Um, he's published a book, Chinese Posters, um, Between Thunder and Rain, and A Century in Crisis, uh, which was the catalog for the 1998 exhibition, A Century in Crisis, at the Guggenheim Museum in New York and Bilbao. Um, he's uh, curated numerous other exhibitions. Uh, he's also a recipient of awards and fellowships from the National Endowment of, for the Humanities, the NEA, Social Sciences Research Camp Council, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, Stanford University, Leiden University. And he's also the editor of a new book series from Brill um, called, it's a new series called Modern Asian Art and Visual Culture, and it's making major contributions to our understanding of um, modern contemporary Asian art. The moderator, these two speakers will give 15-minute uh, uh, presentations, more or less, and then our moderator, uh, who will come up and um, discuss with them, is Robert E. Harris. Um, he is Jane and Leopold Swergold, Swergold, professor of Chinese art history at Columbia University and has published books and articles on Chinese painting, calligraphy, gardens, as well as replicas in Chinese art, clothing in 20th century China, contemporary artists such as Xu Bing, and so forth. His most recent book, The Landscape of Words, which studies the role of language in shaping perceptions of the natural world, was awarded the very prestigious Joseph Levinson Prize in 2010. So we will first welcome Dr. Dadi to the stage. Uh, thanks very much. Um, and uh, thanks especially to Michelle for inviting me and to all the organizers of this, uh, this forum and the exhibition. Uh, so uh, I will not be speaking on Chinese uh, calligraphy because I actually don't know much about it and I'm hoping to learn from all of you. 
but I will speak about a practice of, of a group of artists that uh, actually work with Arabic calligraphy, okay. And, uh, and because we have very little time, I am going to be speaking on only one artist for the most part, whose name is Anwar Jalal Shamsa. And, um, and I edited a monograph on his work, which came out last week. Um, so, um, if people want to look at that later, um, okay. So, um, so first of all, I wanted to lay out my approach to um, to the modernists who have worked in this vein, uh, which uh, is to say that this art is inherently transnational. Um, and one way to think about this practice, uh, you know, in broad strokes, uh, is to think about what happens when European artists from the mid 19th century begin to abandon European perspectival painting and seek aesthetic inspiration from the rest of the world. Uh, when you think about movements like Impressionism and Post-Impressionism and Gauguin and Primitivism, Picasso and his relation to West African sculpture, Clay Matisse and Islamic art, and, uh, and the three founders of abstraction, Malevich, uh, Mondrian, Kandinsky, interested in movements like anthrosophy and theosophy. Uh, what this results is the development of an aesthetic that is becoming global, um, and in which artists from the rest of the world can begin to also participate. Um, so in some sense, this is a universalist project uh, in which the experience of an individual artist is transformed into a utopian aesthetic artifact. But of course, one can never fu fully sublimate uh, uh, oneself from the specificity of a of a place or subjectivity from which, uh, from where one begins. Um, so in some sense, modernism is one, in the sense that we adjudicate work based on values that are universalist, but it is also infinitely differentiated within. Um, the title of our conference, uh, the title of this conference, which is, uh, uh, of this symposium, which is, um, uh, you know, uh, which talks about kind of, in a sense, uh, you know, Asian abstractions, but global, context is therefore uh, uh, an apt one, I think, for me to present this paper. Um, now, between 1955 and 1975, artists from North Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia worked with Ara Arabic calligraphic motifs in entirely new ways. Um, uh, they not only decisively modified the script, but modern Western genres such as academic realism in portraiture, landscape, and still life, um, which were still in vogue uh, in the 1950s were also reshaped by a renewed concern with the abstract and expressive possibilities of the Arabic script, uh, which, was not, uh, which was utilized not simply in a classical manner to render beautifully in a religious, uh, religious verse or a wise uh, saying, or to endow it with ornamental form. Rather, the script was often imbued with figuration and abstraction to a degree that it resisted a straightforward, literal, or narrative meaning. Okay, now to begin to, uh, in a sense, um, think about this in relation to the work of uh, Shamsa, um, uh, let me begin uh, speaking about um, uh, his work, uh, his life and work. So he's born in 1928, dies in 1985, and he's an important modernist in his own right. Um, but he, I, for me, he's also exemplary of a generation of artists who emerged in the wake of the decolonization of Asia and Africa in the, in the, uh, after the Second World War. Uh, Shamsa's work grapples also with issues of belonging in the diaspora as he lived in the, in the UK from the mid 50s till his death in 1985. Born in Shimla in India in 1928 to a Kashmiri and Punjabi family who at the time owned a carpet and military embroidery business, Shamsa studied high school in Lahore after a year in university reading philosophy, Persian, and Arabic, he convinced his father of the seriousness of his artistic vocation and joined the Mayo School of Art in 1944. Upon graduation in 1947, he set up a commercial design studio. The bloody trauma of the partition of India in 1947 into, of, the, of colonial India into the post-colonial nation states of India and Pakistan saw the killing of many of Shamsa's family members, a memory that continued to haunt him throughout his life. Uh, Shamsa taught at various schools and colleges in Lahore until 1956, when he began to study, uh, he, when he moved to London to study at the Slate School of Fine Art. During the late, 
during the late 40s till the mid 50s, Shamsa had become associated with the circles of uh, literary intelligentsia uh, in Lahore, writing in, the, in Urdu. And he contributed to the sphere by his own writings and his organizational work. During this period, literature, poetry, and especially fictional writing de de dominated Lahore's intellectual environment. Even while working on his paintings, Shamsa actively participated in this literary sphere. He published several novels in Urdu. So these are three of his novels that he wrote and published in the 50s. And the covers are designed by him as well. Um, edited a journal for three years, wrote and performed a number of radio plays, and contributed poetry to various publications. At that time, competing stylistic and ideological groups, um, including progressive writers, um, those associated with formalism, and still uh, others who were who were articulating a, a kind of a right-wing Pakistani ideology, were engaged in a, act, a lively and fractious debate okay, in meetings and journals. Uh, the move towards painterly modernism of artists like Shamsa need to be situated accordingly as an affirmation of its metaphoric and allegorical potentialities in offering deeper insight um, into the self and society um, than the kind of reductive realism that progressive writers had increasingly embraced from the late 30s onwards. Shamsa was founder of the Lahore Art Circle, a group of young artists who aspired towards modernism and abstraction during the early and mid 50s. In, 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 and in, in the mid 50s, um, a group of young writers and modern artists began issuing a short lived journal uh, addressing issues faced by modernist thinkers. Their discussions included the relevance of culture, contemporary culture of the modernism of T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, Baudelaire, um, the, you know, the work of Cezanne, Matisse, Clay, and Kandinsky along with the significance of Indian poets and thinkers like Kabir, Mirabai, and other um, uh, Islamic thinkers. Shamsa's exposure to these debates in his later career may be seen in his response to the writings of Rilke and the art of Paul Klee. His embrace of modernism as praxis in a highly disciplined and rigorous fashion, and most significantly in the role that textuality and letterism play in the construction of history and memory in his works. Stuart Hall has identified um, post-war black British diaspora artists as arriving in three distinct waves. The first wave consisted of artists such as Francis Newton Souza, Avinash Chandra, Frank Bowling, Aubrey Williams, David Locke, Ahmed Parvez, um, David Medella. Hall notes, the first generation was born in the 20s and 30s in the far-flung corners of the British Empire when they came to Britain as the last colonials in the 50s and 60s to fulfill their ambitions to become practicing artists. Um, the second wave um, uh, differs from the first in moving beyond modernism and for confronting the question of race um, and social justice in the UK. But for the first generation, Hall continues to note, one immediate contrast between these two waves lies in their um, uh, attitude to modernism. Um, broadly speaking, the artists of the first wave came to London in a spirit not altogether different from, it, from that in which Picasso and others went to Paris to fulfill their artistic ambitions and to participate in the heady atmosphere of the most advanced centers of artistic innovation of the time. As colonials, they had been and were still thought of as marginalized from such developments. In fact, in fact they came to Britain feeling that they naturally belong to the modern movement, and in a way, it belonged to them. The promise of decolonization fired their imagination, their sense of themselves as already modern persons. It liberated them from any lingering sense of inferiority. However, far from being accepted as an equal, uh, the slate years marked an existential crisis for Shamsa that he lucidly summarizes in a statement he writes in 1963. So when he moves to when he moves to the slate in 1956, he moves. He's already very successful as an artist and thinker in in Pakistan. But in his work is not really recognized very well um, uh, when he begins again as a student at the slate. And he says it was a wonderful, depressing time. 
I read a lot, including Rilke's letter to a young poet. It sounded fascinating in the books that if you go wrong, just start again. But in real life, it was a painful process, especially when you didn't know where to start. At the Slade lecture, at a Slade lecture, Professor Gombrich came to the chapter on Islamic art, an art that was functional from his book. I remember leaving the room a few minutes before the lecture finished and sitting on a bench outside. As the students came out, I looked at all their faces. They seemed so contented and self-satisfied. Um, and then he goes on to describe his his crisis, and uh, you know, his uh, the crisis led him to destroy his previous work and um, uh, drove him to you know to restlessness. Um, and he says, uh, uh, "Restlessness sent me from place to place until I found myself in the Egyptian section of the British Museum for the first time in England. I felt really at home. Um, no longer was the search simply to begin again. The search was for my own identity. Who was I?" I had lost my home. I was in exile, homeless, without a name. However, um, Shamza's um, existential crisis was artistic as well as personal. As exhilarating a city that London was, it was also a profoundly alienating place. Due to the sense of dislocation, and because even his previous artistic achievements offered him no solace, the Slade years were highly productive for him. Not only did he work intensively on his own uh, art artwork, he was also exposed to the range of global art um, housed in British Museum collection and engaged in a sustained study of Islamic art from various regions and periods. During these years, the mediation of Paul Clay's work also proved decisive and was acknowledged by Shamza. Among the lessons he learned from Clay uh, was the importance of surface as a plane of modernist experimentation rather than um, uh, a stress on modeling and the freedom and ability to deploy abstraction, geometry, and pattern, much of it described, derived from his understanding of Islamic art towards modernist ends. Uh, as his tutor noted, and I quote, Shamza has been intelligent enough to grasp European art at the point at which it was stretched nearest to the East in the work of Paul Clay. He has made a special study of Clay and has been able to use his influence positively applying his principles of growth and development to the sort of forms that he knows intimately himself, end quote. Shamsa now began to develop work based on his own lived and studied knowledge and experience of carpet patterns, Mughal architecture from Lahore, and calligraphic forms. For that purpose, he continued to collect motifs and materials. Um, it was during the Slate period that Shamsa abandoned his uh, sort of earlier work and began his search for a deeper compositional schema for a calligraphic abstraction. Uh, the artist considered still life to be a breakthrough to, to, into his mature phase. It moves from a volumetric depiction of space and objects in the lower part of the painting to an abstract flattened and um, calligraphic rendering at the upper middle of the canvas prefiguring his later work. So he's basically moving upwards, away from modeling and towards um, uh, uh, flatness. Okay. Uh, Shamsa had met Mary Taylor in 1957, and they were married soon, soon thereafter. Um, they tried uh, after marriage, and uh, uh, you know, as soon as uh, they had they had a child, Shamsa finished his studies and wanted to move to Pakistan um, to find a job there, teaching uh, art. But he was not able to um, secure a job, so they moved back to. Uh, to the UK, and he lives the rest of his life from 1961 until his death in 1985. He lives um, in the UK, but not in London. He actually lives in the Midlands. Okay. Um, okay. Um, now, London from the mid 50s till the 60s was an important center for artists of diverse backgrounds making and exhibiting innovative work. Um, now, living in the Midlands, Shamza continued to investigate the relation between visual and textual practice in his modernist compositions, especially referencing quote-unquote Islamic visual motifs and calligraphic forms. He investigated a small number of themes, city walls, architecture, electronic circuit boards, chess pieces, the letter Meme, the first name of the letter of the Prophet Muhammad, and a few others. He experimented with innovative technical procedures and worked to introduce references to fabrics, textiles, and textures in numerous works. He distilled his experiences into a disciplined formalist practice, much of it based on geometry. Okay, so this is just um, 
you know, the, um, the places where people like Shamza, Shamza and fellow artists who had come from um, into, into London from many places um, is, uh, would show in places like Gallery One and uh, under the rubric, rubric of the Commonwealth, okay? And uh, this particular card, actually, this is a who's, and who's who list of important you know, artists from the Caribbean, from South Asia, and, uh, um, and Africa. Okay. Um, he distilled his uh, experiences into a disciplined formalist practice, much of it based on geometry. For example, in the work 1 to 9 and 1 to 7, he notes, a circle, a square, a puzzle, for which a lifetime is not enough to resolve. These geometric forms would provide him with a set of finite yet flexible building blocks. Much of his work is seen with reference to the let letters of the shapes of the Latin alphabet B and D. Um, however, the calligraphic dimensions in many of his works, especially in the root series, draw from the sinuous lines of the Arabic alphabet as well, and thus venture far beyond rigid geometric abstraction. Much of Shamza's work uh, draw on a creative tension tension between a geometric abstraction derived from the Roman alphabet and the sinuous character of many Arabic scripts. Um, now, Shamza's career culminated in the, let me just show you a few more works. Um, so, uh, sorry. Um, this is, his work was reproduced on the cover of uh, this important exhibition, um, uh, The Other Story at the Hayward Gallery. Um, and uh, just some images from his notebooks. Um, and uh, there are calligraphic references on the lower, um, uh, on the lower uh, sketches. In Love Letter, um, one sees the composition bound by geometric reticulation in passages of varying modulation and frequency. Um, yet here, the Roman alphabet, the work strains against its strict uh, geometric form. On the other hand, when you look at the meme series, which is based on the Arabic uh, letter meme, um, that actually ventures in the other direction towards kind of a strict geometry, okay? Um, okay, uh, just two minutes more, okay? <laughs> okay, uh, Shamza's career culminated in the Root series executed in 1977 until his death in 1985. Structurally, these works often delineate an imagined plant form on the, one, on the upper half of the picture, while the lower half depicts roots. In, in the work developed from 1977, both upper and lower forms are re rendered in flat optical shapes in, on richly textured and dyed cloth. So this is a um, study of, of, you know, uh, from his notebook. This is one of the works in Roots. This is actually ink on paper. And then this one is um, um, Roots 3 from 1984. This is one year before his death. Um, canvas on silk on hardboard, okay. Um, so, and, and they have a grammar. You, uh, on the top, you have these foliate forms, and in the lower, uh, the lower part, you have a, a kind of a roots based upon calligraphic uh, design, okay? Um, um, the, these works relay diaspora in a formally restrained language based on calligraphy and ornamental design inspired by oriental carpets and textiles. Made on a small format, their movable character recalls work by other artists who have grappled with issues of portability of exile, of artistic form in exile. Okay. Um, roots are also, um, while retaining a strong sense of formal discipline, are also more decorative uh, than much of Shamza's uh, earlier work. Now, Adolf Luce had famously declared that modern man's love of ornament was a sign of his criminality and degeneracy. And there's any number of ways in which modernism strove very hard to distinguish itself from pure ornament. It may be noted that Islamic art has, has been characterized in art historical scholarship precisely as ornamental, decorative, and applied, or functional in the way Professor Gombrich had described in his lecture that had proved so shattering to Shamza earlier. For modern artists drawing inspiration from such sources, however, the relation between ornament and decoration cannot be so easily disavowed. In one sense, the Root series brings the dangerous question of ornament and its relation to modernism to a point of crisis, especially with reference to modernism's intimate yet unacknowledged relationship to the decorative arts of the non-Western world. Um, moreover, the roots of the plant forms in, in these works are textual and letterist, suggesting that a return to one's roots can no longer be based on a blood and soil or national affiliation, but the roots themselves have become transnational in their historic and contemporary valences. 
And um, so Sh for, for me, Shamsa is one example of uh, a number of artists who, who work with, with calligraphy. And I'm just going to show you, flash a few images and not talk about these artists, okay? <laughs> um, Madhya Umar from Iraq, okay, 1948, very early work. Shakir Hassan Ali Saeed, who is an Iraqi artist, also a philosopher in terms of, of aesthetics. Um, and um, Charles Hossein Zandarudi, who, who's uh, from Iran, now lives in Paris, okay, and uh, his work. Uh, thank you. Oh, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Michelle, uh, the NT, and also Melissa, and the Asia Society invited me to this event. Uh, calligraphy entered the contemporary Chinese art at the time. The modernist art reappeared in China in the 1980s. Because the Chinese written language is partially ideographic and partially pictographic, when calligraphy entered the modern Chinese art, it follows one of the two paths. The first <coughs> was that the calligrapher began emphasizing the abstraction or the pictoriality in their calligraphic works. The second was the painters brought the calligraphic language and all the, uh, uh, the exploration of the characters in their paintings. So, <coughs> The groundbreaking of the modern uh, uh, calligraphy exhibition uh, in 1985 showcased the cre uh, creative uh, outputs of the artists who intended to experiment with the uh, calligraphy in, the in a modernist manner. They were clearly influenced by the heated discussion of the modernist painting among the domestic uh, <coughs> artists. Other undeniable uh, references, including the few characters a uh, school led by the modern Japanese calligrapher, uh, Inoue Yuichi, <coughs> and uh, other avant-garde uh, calligraphic practice. However, at the time, the discussion among the Chinese artists uh, still uh, stick to the issues of uh, calligraphy entering uh, painting, painting entering calligraphy, or the painting and the calligraphy uh, that share the same roots. The Chinese writing system has been uh, 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 pictographic from the very beginning, since the different ways of the writing were categorized and, uh, uh, aesthetically and stylistically into the different styles and schools, regardless of the textured contents. The relationship between the calligraphy and the painting has become more intertwined and also complicated. As the art of the calligraphy was introduced into painting, it changed the song painting and built uh, the foundations for the literary, paint, uh, literary art artistic tradition. But we should realize this uh, process was not a historical necessity, it was a conscious choice. It not only changed the developmental path of the Chinese painting, but also evoked the people's consciousness of the graphic potential embedded in calligraphy. During the late Qing and the early Republican era, the <coughs> superiority of the steady school over the uh, copy, uh, copy book school among the intellectuals, together with the rise of the epigraphic taste in paintings, led to the heightened awareness of the calligraphy and the painting shared the same root. In fact, go back, if we're going back to the later half of the 19th century, the irregular and yet firmly executed uh, uh, characters of Wu Changshi's stone drum inscriptions would have become the artist's unique contribution to the abstract uh, aesthetics in the art of the calligraphy. As Ling Yutang claimed uh, in the, the gay uh, genius, the life and the time of Shu Dongpo, I quote, so fundamental is the place of the calligraphy uh, in Chinese art as the study of form and the rhythm in the abstract that we may say it has provided the Chinese people with the basic aesthetics and it's brought the calligraphy that the Chinese have learned, uh, learned their basic uh, notions of line, line and form. Among the active uh, the experimental experiments of the 1980s, there were a group of the young artists focusing their attention on creating pseudo uh, characters with calligraphic strokes and compositional structures. 
the main purpose was to define the essence of the calligraphy as, uh, uh, as the line and as the form, not the contents and information. Participants including Xu Bing, uh, like uh, Bai Qianshen, Gu Gan, uh, the Gu Wenda, and the Zhu, Zhu Qingsheng, and the Zhu Wu Shanzhuan, and the Chou Zijian, and others. Uh, their, their pursuit was a very fundamental starting point for the modern calligraphy in mainland China, which urged uh, the modern calligraphy to explore and rethink about the nature of the calligraphy as a form of art. Furthermore, it could encourage people to question and overthrow the established cultural connotation of calligraphy, which would result in a type of the modernist art involving the use of the calligraphic language. Many artists tried to reform, revise, and recompose the traditional writing system in hope that they could push the boundary of the meaning and the forms, formats. The writing system is a uh, concentrated sign of Chinese tra traditional culture, and it has endless plasticity in the terms of the formal uh, structure and meaning making. Such plasticity first came from its abstract structure, that is also pictographic. The, presentation, uh, the uh, pr uh, preservation, uh, preservation and the development of the art and uh, of the writing in China is not because of the pictograph, but uh, for its ideograph. Each character is a representative of the ideographic writing system. During its formational process, the character was standardized with unchangeable basic structures. Consequently, its structure and the ideography are two challenges for the contemporary artist who intended to bring words and writing into their works. From the late 80s and the early 1990s, the single most uh, captivation, uh, miss, uh, cap uh, uh, captivating myth of the moderni modernizing calligraphy lost its attraction. The art uh, artist starts using writing and characters as a resource for their creativity and paying great attention to the artistic concepts, artistic language, as well as the materials and the medias. Gu Wenda <coughs> introduced the pseudo characters into the traditional ink paintings, such as that in his pseudo character series, in which the ordinary characters are, the, uh, are deconstructed, leaving the calligraphic uh, stroke unchanged, but radicals and components dissolved. The pseudo characters enjoy the great formal flexibility, uh, <coughs> con uh, concurrently unusual combination of the character <coughs> uh, the further block the usual thinking process to decipher, and thus generates new meanings. Shipping's early work, Book from Heaven or Book from the Sky, challenges the ideographic nature of the characters he deconstructs the structure of the ordinary meaningful characters and reconstructs new characters without meanings. The unreadable pseudo uh, the Chinese characters are the result of the repetitive meaningless labor, questions and satirize the function of Chinese writing, which had been passing on a culture and a cultural tradition for thousands of the years. The eligibility of the characters emphasized by the artists like Gu Wenda and Xi Bing, directly involved in the nationwide cultural discourse at the time. In the cultural milieu at the time, their practice has a strong connotation of the uh, political propaganda, and thus it attracted attention and discussion beyond art. Today, uh, calligraphy-related uh, works have become the important components in the contemporary art. These works can be categorized into a few groups. The first group can be traced back to the traditional calligraphy, but the artist is trying to employ the modern con concepts and the methodologies. The second group is to add the uh, calligraphic elements to the other forms of the visual art. These two groups um, basically explore the use of the representation of the calligraphic language and uh, elements. The third group uh, introduced the Chinese writing system or <coughs> uh, the structure of the characters to conceptual art, including new media art. On the feeling of the conventionalization uh, in the traditional uh, calligraphy, 
Cho uh, Zhong tries to make the calligraphy a pure form of the visual art and a behavioral, behavioral space and negate the uh, conventionalization in the terms of the form and contents. Wang Dongling uh, running uh, script with the experimental arrangement of the stroke and uh, the composition extended discourse on the abstraction uh, in order to innovate it, uh, new calligraphic forms that carry the modernist awareness. The artist considered the mo uh, momentum and the rhythm of the lines the density and the dryness of the shade, as well as the principle of the composition as a part of the com complete work. Doubtlessly, American abstract expressionism and the calligraphic, uh, 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 character uh, graphic art by the modern Japanese uh, calligrapher, such as the Tashima Yuki and the, uh, you know where uh, this uh, Yuichi, shaded light on Wang Dongling's practice. Artists who are trying to incorporate the calligraphy language into their works, such as Zhang Dawo, who abandoned the legible and the meaningful Chinese characters lined in regular columns and in, uh, insist, uh, instead pursue a true sense of the excitement and even thrill through the spontaneous writing. Zhang Dawo shows a distinctive sensitivity uh, and of motion and mobility uh, in brush strokes and skillfully makes the traditionalist brushworks and the modernist compositional ideas entangled. Thus, the works simultaneously satisfy people's preference for the original pictorial compositions that indicated the modernist awareness and evoke the people's nostalgia for the traditional. During the 1990s, conceptual art, including the new media, art that used the writing or the structure of the Chinese characters flooded into the contemporary art space. This uh, signified that the modernist calligraphy had joined the realm of the postmodern art in terms of the both uh, the concept and the practice. A group of the artists advocated the contemporary calligraphy is actually non-calligraphy, anti-calligraphy, or de-calligraphy. Based on this idea, Wang Nanming and uh, started his installation and the performance art in the forms of the sculpture calligraphy in 1992. At almost the same time, Zhang Chang started launched his performance installation project. <coughs> it, uh, it involved cooperating individually with the young women of the different races, identities, professions, and nationalities. The woman uh, would always decide on the type of brush, size of paper, uh, and the amount of the ink to be used. As she began to move the paper, Zhang Chang would start writing sentences of the real characters. Each time, the <coughs> interaction between the male and the female left a trace of the bro broken brushworks, which together with the documented archives from the site of the art making, became the final artwork. His project deconstructed the writing of the Chinese characters and the questions the calligraphic practice. The performance installation works by Wang and Zhang pushed the calligraphy into the realm of the conceptual art, which broadened the original social role of the calligraphy in the community participation and the cultural construction. Such social constructions uh, in the field of the visual culture can be seen in the other works. Chiu Zijie created a copying the, uh, the Orchid Pavilion preface at Southern Times by copying the text rep uh, repetitively, but always on the same sheet of paper. As the layer of the words dissolved uh, into the solid field of black ink, a, a revered cultural icon was perpetuated and then obliterated. It is another type of the work at, of the time that tackles the cultural uh, inertia in, art, uh, in China. Similar works include Song Dong's Water, uh, the, the Water Diary. In his recent pro, uh, project, uh, the uh, digital series, Wang Tiande replaced the brush with the burning incense to uh, the write on the paper or silk. In this work, each panel consists of two sheets of paper layered one atop, on, uh, atop the other. 
The bottom sheet is inscribed with the copies of uh, classical masterpieces. The top sheets uh, are made of the translucent paper into which the characters have been uh, burned with the cigarette or the incense stick. The artist's great skill in the calligraphy is reflected in the calligraphic composition and the rhythm between the strokes as well as the sophisticated use of the brush. Xu Bing never uh, separated the word from image, but he keeps pushing his own boundary and the challenging to the to ordinary mindset of the viewers. In his reading or writing uh, landscape, the artist goes so far to translate a landscape into uh, characters, turning the, uh, the landscape painting into the pictographic construction. He employs the characters of the mountain, stone, grass, wood, water, and uh, uh, the earth, uh, birds, to present the whole landscape. He claims, I quote, Chinese literary artists are proud of the synchronization of poem, calligraphy, and painting. So I try to make all three things into one. You can argue that it is a piece of the calligraphy or painting or text. Brush and ink can become the game. In work of the uh, contemporary Chinese art, we see that the expression of the calligraphic language and its uh, application of characters presents many serious obstacles. On the one hand, uh, on the other hand, uh, calligraphy and the Chinese characters with the source still have the great potential. These artists, rega regardless of what concept, methods, or the formats they use, self-consciously link their art to the construction of the cultural identity and the social circumstances of the contemporary society. This artistic phenomena has already become the important part of the contemporary visual culture. Beyond the, uh, the, the researching uh, it as a part of the conventional art history and the aesthetics, we must also emphasize its visuality, which is not just the visibility, but imply an understanding of cultural process. Thank you very much. So thank you both very much. I learned about uh, artists and works that I knew nothing about uh, 45 minutes ago, and I'm very grateful for that. It seems that the most fruitful or the most productive theme that uh, we could talk about linking your two presentations has to do with calligraphy, or maybe more fundamentally with writing. And this issue of the artists, Shima and the various guys you showed, working with writing seems to me to tie in to a very broad theme that was announced at the beginning of the afternoon. And that is the relationship between what you might call the local and the global. Because the, the curious thing about writing in whatever script or whatever language is that um, once you can read it, you can't turn off literacy. And for a reader of the various Arabic scripts or for a reader of Chinese, this access to the meaning embedded in these marks mm -hmm. is inescapable. And it is a kind of paradox in the whole art of calligraphy itself, which we often talk about as the most expressive, the art through which you really reveal your soul through the motion of the brush and so on. But at the same time, it's the most restricted of all arts because every character you write is, in one sense or another, a copy of a character that's already been written. The only way you can learn to write is through copying. Even the wildest grass script in China still follows certain stroke orders. So you're working within parameters that are inherited, that are given by the writing system, given by the culture. So I was just wondering if maybe the two of you could talk about this together. When an artist like Shema incorporates calligraphy or incorporates what looks to uh, someone who is illiterate in the language, 
like calligraphy, well, I mean, there are two audiences. I mean, there, there's the audience, or well, the readership of those who could actually read mm -hmm. the script, and people like me who, well, it might be calligraphy, it might not. It, 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 it uh, may be pseudo calligraphy, or with Xu Bing. I mean, the only way that you can perceive that something is a pseudo character is to know real characters. And I've always been very curious about what effect Kim Shu, uh, Shu Bing's famous book from the sky really has for those who don't read Chinese. When you read Chinese and you approach book from the sky, at first you think, oh, I can read this. And then that moment of frisson comes and you're really confused. But if you can't read Chinese to begin with, I don't know how this, this happens. So I guess what I'm curious to hear you talk about is how the fact that calligraphy is writing and writing conveys meaning and uh, viewers of these works who are literate in the languages these scripts record can't escape this. So there's this, this constant interplay between access to something you, you can understand and its transformation into something you, you, you cannot. I think maybe that's active or that's operative in, in, in some, of the, some of the art that Professor Dottie showed us to, and, and certainly with the, the Chinese calligraphers. So that's just an observation, so I'll let you two talk about it. <laughs> okay, to begin, yeah. No, thank you. Uh, yeah, so the artists that, uh, Shamza, but also some of the other artists who have, uh, uh, who, you know, who work with the Arabic script. So first of all, the Arabic script is not only used for Arabic, right? So it's also right. used for many other languages, such as Urdu, Persian, and historically was also used in places like Central Asia and Indonesia and so on, right? So, um, but then there's another, there's another way in which uh, most people learn to read, like Muslims might learn to read the Quran, but if they're not Arabs, they may not actually understand what they're reading, right? So you may actually learn to read the letters and pronounce them, but without necessarily understanding uh, the meaning, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a liturgical language as well, right? So that already, for, for, for most people, that already uh, brings in a level of... Uh, of uh, dislocation, okay, from, from the, That's from the okay. Uh, the second thing that happens with many of these artists, and it's really a kind of a post-war, you know, uh, you know uh, development, is that, um, is that many of these, uh, uh, these artists are actually not writing legible, uh, you know, but they are using the, or they are thinking about deploying the, uh, the, the, the script as a kind of a graphic, uh, as a graphic marker. Well, may I ask okay. you, in yeah. the, one of the final works you showed, yes. the, one of the Roots yes. series, it looks as if there are flowers above. Yes. And then something below that could have been script or yes. not. We, is that legible? It's, I mean, well, it, it, looks like, uh, it looks like shapes of letters, but it's not really. So it is pseudo yeah. writing. It's pseudo writing, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think for this question of illegibility and blankness also for me has to do with the artist thinking it's a, it's a decolonizing aesthetic. It's also transnational because many of these artists are working, they're Iraqis and Sudanese and, you know, many other artists who are working out uh, mm -hmm. this aesthetic but without necessarily um, in direct communication with each other. Okay, so it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a general problem of culture of how to go forward without necessarily uh, beginning from zero. In other words, how do you recognize the past, right, as, as a source for uh, moving forward, but also recognizing that the past can no, no longer function as a, as a kind of, so it, it, it's, it's a paradoxical move because it simultaneously recognizes the need to connect with the past, but also recognizing the impossibility of making it uh, transparent and legible. Well, okay. in the case of the Roots yeah. piece, yeah. Uh, for, yeah. for someone who is literate in, in one of the languages for which the script is used. Mm -hmm. Do you have that experience of when you first see it, you think, oh, oh, maybe I can read this. Yes. But then you can't. But then you cannot, yeah. So it, it, he sort of takes you to the brink of, of meaning, yes. of, of uh, semantic content, but then it's not there. But then it's not there, and you, it's, you're put in this paradoxical position of both Invoking tradition in the past, but without without but without having access to it at the same time. Right? Well, this sounds so, a little like Shubin. Right? Yeah, that's right. 
Yeah, I think the, your question is very good. Uh, talk about uh, <coughs> the, I think that basically they have two groups I, I, I mentioned before. Have the one group, the photographers, they uh, started uh, experimenting kind of the new kind of choreography, the modern choreography, or contemporary choreography. They basically still, I think, uh, leave the meaning there. The characters still have the meaning, the, if, as you said. And you, can, you can read them. In, in, yeah, you can read them, in, no matter what kind of format, even just uh, push into the ab very abstract format, mm -hmm. but still you can read, right? So this is the one thing. But when the conceptual artists uh, step in, I think in the 19, start from the 1980s, like the shipping and Gwenda's group, they mm -hmm. got in. Like you mentioned, the shipping is the early this, the book from the uh, sky, book from heaven. The, I think the audience that time for shipping's works is still very domestic. Actually, that's not for mm -hmm. the international audience. That work that time, the China is not internationalized yet. So the very, very much the challenge of people's perception of the this uh, written words because that the, you know background is that time the China just opened mm -hmm. and there's so many uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the concepts and the new kind of the philosophy the idea came from outside the world and also from China that itself from from the, the traditional kind of ancient things back so it's very challenging for the young generations kind of overwhelming so these kind of the with this kind of the an enormous this kind of printed words the pseudo words there and the, the people just like you said, that first they thought they can read it, but they, then when after that they, they encountered this kind of thing, they find they couldn't read it at all mm -hmm. because it's not real words, no meaning. But this kind of frustration actually that is it should be trying to catch it and mm -hmm. uh, trying to raise the kind of discussion, raise the people's sure. rethinking about the Chinese culture, traditional Chinese culture. Mm -hmm. But I think that shipping's work, I know the work I didn't show here is very interesting. It's more uh, deal with the international audience. Uh, is the new English choreography. I think that many of you possibly already know this, her, her later work uh, in the, after he, he moved to the United States. This time he the more deal with the kind of international audience. He created the, the English uh, the words, but in the, uh, the uh, format of the Chinese characters, one single, single is kind of characters, actually the one English word. So this is time is, uh, you know, China, Chinese the people's, uh, the viewers kind of perception to the things they thought so see this kind of the, uh, Chinese character look like these kind of the words there. The all the, uh, the, the, the from East Asia people, they're familiar with a certain kind of square characters, no matter the Chinese, Korean, or the Japanese. First, we thought, from far, we thought this must be something we can read. But after they went there, find that this, no, this is not any kind of words we're familiar with or we know. But when the Eng uh, people speak English, at the beginning, they... <laughs> keep it far away because they say this kind of was we have no way to read it kind of words. this is not belong to our culture but after stand up to, to look at it carefully then quickly to find that these words every word is actually English words so this kind of he playing this kind for the conceptual artist I think the here uh, this the meaning trying to challenge uh, the meaning and the, uh, this, uh, the, the, the with the format of the character of the uh, this, uh, the language so this kind of thing is quite interesting I see that from all both um, different sides. Well, I mean, so many of these these artists, most notably Xu Bing, are you know, international art stars now. And I guess you have to assume that whatever they do is addressed to multiple that's audiences, right. multiple readerships. But I think that's probably very true. When Book from the Sky was first shown, 1980... 1987. 87, it, it, it was a, a local product. But then... I, I, Continue to think about this this very famous work. It prob correct me if I'm wrong. Book from the Sky became the first internationally known work of Chinese art. It, the sun never set on a Xu Bing show mm -hmm. of Book from the Sky. It's probably on view somewhere right now, and and it continues to fascinate, even though it's a, it it is being perceived by uh, very very different. Readership, very, very different authorship. Well, of course, one can't really say readership since nobody can, can read it. Yeah, I think the possible, it's right, I don't know if we can say the first, uh, this, possibly, yeah, you're right, possibly the first international known, the conceptual artist at that time. We should say maybe this is the first real kind of conceptual art uh, displayed in the National Museum and started to know, then, of course, of course, the loss of discussion there, but it's really the first kind of conceptual art appeared in the general audience. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make one more observation before I think we'll have questions. Uh, and I think we're going to hear more about Paul Clay later 
in the afternoon. But what you showed us of Shima's sort of dis discovery of clay and mm -hmm. the way it had a big impact on his, his art. I mean, there's, a, as we'll see, a close parallel with uh, the career of Zhao Wuqi, yes. who, yes. who uh, loved clay yes. and, and whose early work shows, shows this connection. So, uh, shall we take questions now? Okay. okay. Um, anybody? So, so, can I just say one? Thing? Oh, please yeah, do. So, so just sorry. in terms of, you know, uh, so I didn't show the works of uh, artists from the 80s onwards who, who worked with that category, who are also in some ways conceptual artists. And in that case, legibility acquires a different valence, in the sense that there is the, 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 the text might be legible, but it might be legible in ways that are, that still create um, uh, uh, aporias, okay? <laughs> Uh, but for this generation of artists who came of age in the you know in the post-war period until, until about the 70s or 80s, for them the question I think it's it's really around towards towards abstraction as well as um, as well as a kind of a, 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 a complex negotiation with the question of modernity and tradition. Okay, so, so those are. Uh, as um, as Professor ha um, Harris ju just said, um, in in the writings, so there's always meanings there, um, and I so when we compare um, Zhu Bing's work and um, Gu, Wen, uh, Gu Wenda's work, so um, the way I see it is um, Zhu Bing tried to um, uh, break the meaning, or I can say deconstruct them the the meaning there, while um, Gundai is um, uh, try to re reconfigure the the um, the meaning there. So will that be the reason that um, Zhu Bing's work has better international perception than Gundai's work? Because they prob they almost start to making the the work at, um, around the same time, 1987, 1985 ish. So. Um, so, I, well, I guess because um, the international audience couldn't read the Chinese character, then um, the way how Zhu Bing uh, approached that is better to appeal to the people who can't read Chinese. I don't know. Uh, the <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know this kind of comparison uh, the established or not, but uh, uh, Gwenda's work actually started this kind of thing sl slightly earlier than she been, and uh, he started about 1984 time, start bringing the, this kind of the, uh, this uh, pseudo character into his work, and uh, combined with his uh, landscape painting, I showed uh, this several examples you can show here. So as you said, uh, the Gwenda, although the, he did construct the structure of the original character the reconstructor in the new characters, but still trying to embed the meaning underneath, right? So the, uh, the, the making meaning, that, that's right. But the shipping, actually the work is slightly later, although, you know, he started work on 1986, but the first to show his work is at the end of 1987. And his, actually his work has uh, been known by the international, uh, the world much later in the early 1990s, when he uh, came to the United States in the 1992, the first is showing his work, actually this work they haven't shown in, uh, in, uh, in outside of China, not until the actually late 19, uh, the, uh, in the middle of 1993, it's the first time the Book of Heaven combined with other works is showing in the Waxman Center uh, in, uh, in, in, in Ohio. The uh, first work he's showing uh, in the United States actually is a ghost pounding wall, is another kind of rubbing from the Great Wall to showing that. So the, I think the people first know shipping actually not from this uh, crown heaven, but uh, I think that the in fact from the, his early works, uh, Ghost Pounding Wall, combine his later showing, his first time showing the Book of Heaven actually with another uh, piece of uh, the work together, is that he can uh, the make the one kind of pseudo book and uh, from uh, the, the based on the this, uh, New Testament, uh, the Bible, and also the novel, uh, the novel. Uh, Combined together, make the kind of meaningful uh, book uh, that display the ways this book from the sky together. That time he called a cultural negotiation. He's trying to show his uh, frustration of the deal with it. No matter in China, he deal with the Chinese character. So come out is this book from the sky. 
and come to the United States, actually he uh, facing another challenge, is a new language to him. He still cannot understand anything <laughs> for him. So he uh, combined this book. That's the time this piece of work called the Negotiation, actually the, the kind of the two cultures that he faced. It's very from his personal kind of the feeling. At that time, he cannot speak English at all. So he's uh, very difficult for him. So this kind of, you can see from his, this, and also I think the, uh, the audience in the United States started to, f to familiar with Shipping's uh, work also from this kind of the, uh, perspective to look at this. Then gradually find that this, even you cannot read the, uh, this, of course no one can read the book from him, but uh, uh, deal with this kind of Chinese characters, actually find this kind of concept, concept behind, embedded behind this, actually the, very interesting and also uh, this uh, challenge not only the Chinese culture, domestically, but in the international, actually internationally, in the other culture, dealing with the same kind of issues. So this, I think, the makes Gwenda, uh, the diff difference is Gwenda's work actually became very uh, famous in China in the middle of 1980s. But after he came to, you know, uh, came to the North American in 1986, actually he switched his uh, this kind of the experience in a completely different way. He started, actually he abandoned this kind of the, the early series of these uh, pseudo characters here. Because he figured out, you no know, one understand what he's, you know, he's pursuing there. So he started to use the different things and also possibly, or no, he started to switch to the, the parts of the body, started to use the blood from the other things, then started to use hair, the, the back to, the, then not until the, about the 1995, 1996, he started to use hair to reconstruct this kind of the pseudo words he uh, the, 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 the started in the 10 years ago, uh, in uh, 10 years before in, in, the, uh, in, in China. So they're slightly different. I don't know how to compare these two, but you know they do have the, the kind of the context behind it. Uh, Pepe, did you have a question? Yes. Thanks. Uh, Iftikhar, I have a question for you that's really provoked um, by a few months ago when I was looking at your fantastic book on Shemza. One of the things that struck me about it was that often hidden in the interstices of the patterns and the calligraphic imagery are these very erotic images of women's right, bodies. Right. And uh, there a few of them flashed by on the screen today. And I was thinking, not really of any of the Chinese artists that we've looked at so far today, but of Shan Yu, who was in, another Chinese artist in Paris working throughout much of the 20th century, who's known, of course, for his highly erotic news that are kind of combination by Digliani and Picasso, and then to bring in a third artist, um, F.N. Souza, let's say, mm -hmm. who similarly focuses on the nude in the paintings he did in exile in London. So my question is, is it possible that the image of the nude, the erotic nude, becomes a marker of cosmopolitanism in modern art, and that in the post-colonial situation you're discussing, that represents somehow a kind of liberation from one's original culture and an accession to Western culture. Um, yeah, so the, I mean, the, you can see, people can see the, the images in the, in the book here, okay. Uh, so even his nudes are quite stylized, you know, and uh, in some ways they, uh, the, it's a tension between uh, either a calligraphic or an architectural form and, and, the, and, the, new, and the nude figure. So, the, so, the, uh, so the, they're experimental in the sense that they, uh, they, they, they're at the intersices of, you know, figuration and uh, another, kind of a graphic sign, which might be an architectural arch or something like that, or, uh, right? So, um, and of course, in, in the sense that when we think of modernism, we think of certain, um, we, we think of certain, um, uh, let's say that there is a kind of a, um, there is a set of motifs, okay, that many modernist artists would, would, would return to, and that included the, the female figure, uh, which becomes a springboard for experimentation, and which is also, uh, you know, in the sense that it is both fascinating and problematic in some ways. I mean, the, you know, feminists have criticized this, that does modernism has to be erected on the backs of, you know, nude women, you know. But in the sense that that, that is very much the case, right? Uh, but that is the case, that, that, that subcontext that runs throughout modernism, I would say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Francesca already has the mic, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, it's a question for you. If you care about uh, the, I don't know if I missed it, but uh, this um, use of uh, calligraphy or the script yeah. in the art of, of uh, the artist that you discussed is something that um, 
the, the, how does it come about? <laughs> is it something that I imagine calligraphy was in Islamic art is uh, also important as a form of, of art, uh, uh, as the way it is yeah. in Chinese art. Yeah. But maybe not exactly the same. I'm not so sure if it has the same kind of status. Yeah. But is this a self-conscious, uh, how to say, observation of influence of of of, of of events and episodes that he realized are part of this global um, mm, movement, or is it own, his own reflection upon uh, the possibility of creating a post-colonial form of modernity? I mean, yeah, how does yeah. it come about to yeah. the use? So, so very, I mean, very boldly speaking, the difference is, you know, again, this is simplifying grossly. The difference is, is that uh, mostly Arabic script is not written with a brush, and it is not... It, it's not necessarily expressive in the same way that uh, you know perhaps Chinese calligraphy might be. Okay. Um, on the other hand, you know he he's a he's a as I mentioned he's a writer who writes extensively in Urdu and you know so he would have written all these. So in other words, he is, you know, he would not have typed his novels. He would have written them by hand and so on. In fact, we have the transcripts of his uh, radio plays and so on, which are all written by hand. So he's very he's very intimate with writing, right, by hand, um, and. Um, and in terms of whether this is a personal project, this is part of a larger, um, I think it's both. So in the sense that what you have is in the hands of people like Shamza, but also in, in Zandarudi and Shakir Hassan, you know, these are parallel experiments taking place, okay, often without, with, with, with imperfect knowledge of each other's work. So it's not, a, it's not a movement in the sense of all of them having come together and written a manifesto or something like that. But it is, uh, you know, what I find important is that this is actually, uh, let's say, an aesthetic. Uh, it's an aesthetic problem that is faced by a, a group of artists, and you know, living in a wide, uh, in a very wide, from all the way from North Africa to South Asia. Okay, so and that's actually very fascinating for me to see how many of these artists are involved in a in a kind of a parallel search for thinking about the question of modernity and abstraction by. Uh, by redeploying uh, the Arabic script. Okay. okay. This is happening in the 50s? Yeah, from the 50s to about the 70s, 80s. So how much are there in, 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 uh, in tune with the you know, explosion of interest in calligraphy that takes place in kind of um, Western part of, 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 of artistic? Yeah, so it, that's what I'm saying, that in some ways there would be, I mean, the, the longer this was a, 15 minutes is not enough really, you know, but in the sense you also have to think about, you know, surrealism and automatic writing, you have to think of movements like letterism in, in Paris, right? I mean, I think uh, you also have to think about, and I think these people are, you know, uh, there's a way in which um, uh, the, the intellectual and artistic formation of this, you know, group of post-war artists is in dialogue with, with, the, with you know, and they are aware to, to varying degrees of what's happening in places like Paris, right? Uh, through magazines, through newspapers, through, uh, you know, they may not actually have seen, uh, you know, original works in, if they were living in Lahore or, or Baghdad or something, you know, but uh, some, many of them traveled and, and, and st spent time in Paris or London, so they become uh, exposed to this, right? I, I've been notified yeah. there's time for one more question. Yes, please. First, I want to thank you because this is all good learning for me. And um, you're talking a lot about last century, and I wonder about this century. I think this century could be summed up in three things. We're dealing with global negotiations, the rise of capitalism in China, and war. And how has these topics been depicted among this kind of artists that are using um, the calligraphy and uh, and you know we don't even have to go into calligraphy; it just splashes. <laughs> and I just want to know about who's doing it and how they're doing it. And well, it's too big a question to answer. In, you know, I mean, you know, that's a whole topic. I'm well, sorry. We should, should have a session. Of <laughs> well, I think uh, we should thank our speakers. <laughs> and. Um, I just want to congratulate again Anthony and Melissa and uh, Michelle for putting on this wonderful show downstairs. If you haven't seen it, it's really great. And so now we take a break? Yes. Yeah, a break. <laughs>